sitting in a holdover cell. And he's sitting there, and he's sitting there, and he's sitting there. And then he's sitting there three minutes before the breath test without any police officer uh, with him. And then he's taken into a breath test room, and he's given a breath test three minutes later, and boom, 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 boom. And, of course, I sat down with the prosecutor and shared that with him before trial. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? He's like, of course I did. Of course I did. Why would I do that? They're going to wire around it. Something, something's going to, something else. It's been my experience that it isn't like something else is going to be off. It's just, I mean, or that they're going to tell me the truth. They're just going to try to figure out a way to wire around it. That's exactly what they did when all this, all this starts to happen in this case. And Officer McCray was the officer. Gosh, he's been, he's been a task force officer for so long. He's experienced. And he's such a nice man. And I went up there and I was talking to him because um, I had I'd sponsored another police officer's son's little league football team. And I was talking to him about that. And I was really nice talking to him about his family. And I was just getting them all warmed up before I cut his head off. And, uh, and I went up to Officer McCray and I took my sort of my cross examination. I said to Officer McCray, boy, that was a really. That was a very interesting story you told the jury about this case. And he smiled and said, yes, sir, Mr. Stokeman. I was like, you know, this whole thing with the observation period and all that, he just lied. <laughs> and, God, you know, as lawyers, it's just, you know, we just we dream about those things. You know, we dream about those opportunities. And Officer McCray just looked at me and was like, excuse me? I was like, well, no. I was like, what I'm saying is you lied under oath. And what do we call that? I was like, what do, what do we call that in a courtroom like this? Perjury. That's what it is. Exactly right. I was like, and then Judge Stanley leaned over the bench and he's looking at me. And then I just looked at Officer McCray and I said, Officer McCray, go ahead, ask me. Ask me. He's like, what? I was like, ask me how I know that you lie. <laughs> and, and, and he's just, you know, you're not supposed to behave this way. No, you're not. And the jury's, I'm sorry, like, the jury's sitting there like, we thought this was just a DWI case, but this is great. And then, uh, so then, I, then I'm then i like, Officer McCray, remember that whole video thing you told me that y'all don't have the videos from Central One Talks that they're recorded over and da 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 Guess what? I got them. Okay? And, and then the state stands up and they're like, predicate, he hasn't pre-filed this. And then my associate turned it out sitting at a council table and there were some descriptive adjectives that were used to describe me, and they're not so nice. And, um, you know, then, um, I was like, you know, officer, so Officer McCray has an opportunity to look at it. You know, we recess. You know, this judge is going to try to save the day. You know, I love Judge Stanley, but he's trying to give offer. Officer McCray an opportunity to clear up the misrepresentations that I've made in the record. And so then, um, Officer McCray, what do you think the first thing Officer McCray said? Well, those cameras are off. I was like, you know what, Officer McCray? You lied again. I was like, yeah. And you know what? It's like, I knew before you got a chance to talk again. You were going to say that because we've I've listened to this before out of you improper. Oh, I'll withdraw that anyway. And so, um, I was like, The reason I know that is because look, I got these records, and these are is that your unit number? Gosh, what time does it say you arrived at the station at 207? God, what time are you walking in the back door? 209 and 30 seconds. That makes sense. So, you and I can agree that the cameras, the clocks are right, everything's right. The only thing that's wrong is that you didn't follow the 15 minute observation period, and um. And the jury is just fucking pissed. And they don't care that my client had problems standing up. It was just like it was offensive. And, 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 and you know, the jury, 3823 instruction on whether or not the 15-minute observation period was followed. And then, even if it's only a part of your case, you know what the closing argument is going to be at that point. If they're going to lie to you about this, what else do they lie to you about? And this is one of those cases where Officer McCray, what did you pull over my client for? Well, he, uh, he ran a red light. Did you give him a ticket for that? And I understand that all of us have the tendency of telling ourselves that doesn't matter. You know, that you know they, when they arrest you for a greater offense, they're not going to get a ticket. Don't defeat yourself before you start it. To them, it matters. If he really committed the traffic offense, why didn't he get a ticket? Are you meaning to tell me that it's the Houston Police Department's policy to not generate money for the city of Houston? And if you really believe, if you really believe that a traffic offense took place, of course you're going to write the ticket. How, you mean to tell me in your entire career, in the 25 years you've been with the Houston Police Department, you've never given a person a ticket when you arrested them for DWI? Why well, don't recall? Oh, okay. We've heard that before at this trial. And it's like, all of a sudden, it's like you've created an uprising. Okay? They, it's like you've wasted our time here. Not guilty verdict. Okay? Not guilty verdict. And so, don't take those little things. Failure to give a ticket. You know, it's just, those little things are what add up to not guilty verdicts. Okay?
All right, but in between, there's one case that we have left off that, that's kind of, that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I had represented this person in uh, Liberty County who had a, uh, this was an auto life uh, indecency by contact line case. My client was a horrible human being, really was, a very bad human being. If anybody saw the Green Mile, my client looked exactly like Billy the Kid in Green Mile. He had this slick back hair and every single finger was tattooed. And he was accused of touching his girlfriend's daughter. And he had been accused of this before once and had been found not guilty in Georgia. He'd been accused of it again uh, and he had uh, pled to it and had it deferred that had been revoked. And then there was one other one that I believe was dismissed and then my case. And uh, this guy was just kind of a rough character but still entitled to his day in court and effective assistance of counsel. And so we go to trial in Liberty County in this case. Uh, and just a, a, a very, that's a very scary jurisdiction for those of you that haven't tried cases in Liberty County. Another place that isn't very liberal and everybody knows each other and uh, they don't have a problem handing out life sentences. And so we proceed to try this case and um, it's a touch case. And um, I was like, God, I've done this before. We can deal with touch DNA. Touch DNA over there in Liberty County, uh, it doesn't exist. Okay, there's no such thing as uh, touch DNA. And so the prosecutor quickly figured out in that case that that was essentially my whole defense. That, you know, you, you cops came to this was an immediate outcry, that the officers went out there to the scene. It's like we were accused of touching the girl over her pants. And, uh, and you didn't collect the pants, and how can we know that any touching took place uh, if you didn't collect the pants? And so we're going through, I'm going through my cross-examination with these police officers, and I'm building a foundation for this lack of touch DNA. And uh, during my board ire in that case, I had talked about CSI and, you know, how, you know, this they tried to tell you, because we all listen to it from the state, that CSI is something just on TV, that's a bunch of bullshit. It's like, all of us have seen the CSI vans driving around, it's like, it ain't nothing fancy, it's just collecting evidence. And so in that case, my whole defense was going to be this lack of evidence. And then they bring in this slew of cops that are just like, have you ever heard of anything called touch DNA? No. <laughs> so that's just kind of like the prosecutor, I think, threw in a little sidebar on that case. That's like Perry does. You know, just a, you know, one of the, and they're making fun of me. And it's like, unbeknownst to them, then we get up to the most experienced officer, been an officer for 37 years, and he gets up there, and he actually had a college degree and had studied biology in undergraduate school, and the minute I heard the word mitochondria come out of his mouth, I was like, I approached the bench, and I was like, Your Honor, he's like, yes, sir, Ch Judge Chap Kane, very gentleman, he's very polite. I mean, he'll cut off your head, but he's very nice about it. But um, he, uh, I was like, Judge, you know, uh, upstairs on the third floor of the courthouse, I have, uh, you know, my DNA expert. They didn't file a request for notice of expert witnesses, so I, I had my DNA expert hiding in the third floor of the courthouse. And my defense in that case was the minute they got into anything really scientific, I was going to bring him in. And boy, I'll tell you what, that trial changed like that. I was like, Judge, I want to introduce you to Dr. Michael Spence, and this is his CV, and da 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 and the judge knew exactly what I was doing. He said, Grant, bring him in. Have him sit down. And so then this officer was just like, oh, oh, mito. I was like, mitochondria, that's where we left off. I was like, honestly, I was like, let's tell the jury that what you do know is that touch DNA is it exists, right? Yeah. And I was like, and you worked all these different years at all these different police agencies, and you have seen it used many times before. Yep. And you've seen it prove or disprove that this man actually touched a person. Yeah. So when you told the jury it didn't exist a few minutes ago, thanks for being here, Dr. Spence, it's like, that would be an absolute lie, wouldn't it? It's like, well, it just, you know, it just, you can say it, or it is part of the case. I was like, can you tell these people that are sitting here why it's not part of this case? And um, he's like, no, I can't, I can't. And it just sinkholed sink their entire case. Just sinkholed their entire case. And so the lesson I learned from, uh, from that case was that, um, you know, once again, another example, that the lack of evidence is evidence, okay? Why did, I just, um, and we'll get to it in a minute, but I just, the case that I finished that was so contentious in court, one, I was sitting there looking at my evidence submission form in this blood test case, and I'm like, ugh, this isn't a good case, what am I going to do with this? And then the fourth box on that form says we can check for blood, we can check for ballistics, we can check for DNA. 
Why wasn't the DNA in the blood checked to compare it with my client and then come in and tell this jury beyond all doubt that that's even her blood? Lack of evidence. Lack of evidence. Very important. Um, this was the next case that um, I had tried, uh, Ms. Thompson. And Ms. Thompson uh, had started out, she was accused of interference with the duties of a public servant. Um, and this was just a, uh, uh, my client was arrested because she was highly intoxicated at a bar. And then the officer claimed that she actually committed assault against a peace officer and had just kicked the crap out of him. Uh, and the officer uh, just got on the witness stand and told a completely different story uh, from what was in the police report. And just absolutely um, just not credible. And it was one of those cases where the lesson I learned from this is, is holding back. Because sometimes we'll get these officers that, um, that aren't very smart. And this guy, he, he was Asian, and his English wasn't really good. And it was very, real easy to feel sorry for him. And the, I wrote a big note to myself when I tried this case, and the note was slow down. Because there was so much fruit uh, to pick off that tree that in years past, I've started to shift that way because I've been so excited to go just kill this guy that uh, I've turned that person, that witness, into the underdog. And the thing I kept telling myself through this trial was don't do that. Don't do that. Slow down. Be nice. Slow down. Slow down. And then ultimately, when I, after about the 10th or 15th impeachment with the offense reports, um, that was the end of that. And, um, and, and that resulted in, in a not guilty verdict. Okay. okay. And um, this was the um, this was the uh, this was the last case that I had tried uh, this year, and this was a case that was on the news uh, involving this young lady who was accused of PWI with a uh, 0.17 uh, blood test. And um, this was a uh, this case. This lady had uh, judges in her family. She had lawyers in her family. It was just one of those cases you wish you hadn't gotten hired on, to be honest. Because it was just very nerve-rattling experience. I had a, a, a very high-brow partner at the law firm sitting in the courtroom monitoring what I was doing. Sat with me at counsel table when I litigated the prosecutor's ethics. And it was just, you know, people think that I enjoy that, which I do enjoy that. But at the same time, everybody that was around me in my office uh, uh, knows how much it took out of me and how difficult it was because, you know, it is so much at stake. But in this case, uh, this was a DWI, horrible driving, holy cow. This was uh, weaving all over the road, and you know we always complain about it not being on video, but they had it on video in this case. Weaving all over the road, went over the curb, got pulled over, uh, officer approaches the vehicle, um, my client's just like, I'm not gonna say anything. I mean, it was just, the whole, it was a very challenging case. Um, the officer, in this case, uh, does one field sobriety test uh, at the scene, the HGN test, and boy, he did it perfect. He was great. Did a very good job during the HGN test. And for those of you like horizontal gaze and nystagmus when you deal with DWI cases, I spent uh, several years, I would bring in an HGN expert, and uh, HGN expert, uh, a board certified ophthalmologist, he would come in and tell the jury this big thing about eyes and all that. And I was losing a lot of cases, uh, honestly. And um, I sat there and I just really thought about all this deal with the HGN test. You don't have to have the kind of training I have to, to deal with the HGN test and all your DWI cases. All of us have nystagmus, okay? It is a naturally occurring thing, okay? Period. The officer that comes into contact with your client, he doesn't know what your client's natural level of nystagmus was before he came into contact with her and he doesn't know um, what it was when he came into contact with her. He has absolutely no training in the eye. He's not a doctor, he's not a nurse, and you certainly didn't have probable cause after you did the test, did you? Boom, 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 that's it. We don't gotta talk about the eye test anymore because all of us got it and he doesn't know what her natural level is. And so in this case, that was just like I always do. Um, and you just can't, you know, oh, and then in this case, they, boy, they were ready. I have to hand it to the state. They did a great job on them losing. 
But um, <laughs> they, uh, um, they had the uh, they had they had this HGN video which shows what a normal eye looks like, what a, an eye that has alcohol uh, in it. And understand that seminal case on the HGN is a case called Emerson versus State. That's I think it's a 1989, 1992, 89 or 92, I believe. Um, case that deals with the admissibility of the HGN test, um, and essentially uh, the proposition that the case stands for is that if you make an objection, you're entitled to have a hearing outside the presence of the jury so that the state can establish the third prong of Kelly on whether or not they did it correctly. Cops have gotten better at doing it. Usually, um, I think they have the cheat sheets, and they just testify for the cheat sheet, and so they're able to say that they did it correctly. But very important, the most important thing with the HGN test is that you don't allow the officer to correlate the HGN test to a blood alcohol level. And Emerson stands for that proposition. And so don't let the officer do that. Well, he had six clues and that means he's one one three. It's like, you can't do that. Okay, that's what the case says. So anyway, in this case, we deal with the HGN test. The HGN test came into evidence. Um, my client says a bunch of stupid things out there at the scene uh, before she's in custody. So that wasn't a good thing. And then the officer uh, takes her to the station and uh, just not a uh, not the best station video, and then the uh, they get a warrant for her blood. Now, in this case, very interesting issue came up in trial that the officer had written the search warrant affidavit and made a mistake because the judge had told him that he made it. Well, you forgot to put this in there and this in there, so why don't you go ahead and shred that first affidavit, and then we're going to rewrite the second affidavit. And it's like. Oh, okay, you made a mistake, and you know, I guess that's not a big deal. Are you kidding? This is my trial. So, you know what I call an affidavit that you wrote, that you swore to about the facts in this case? I call that evidence, period. And I was entitled to see it before this trial. And you know what I call it when a person shreds, shreds a piece of evidence? I call that tampering with evidence is what I call that. And it's like, so you have tampered with evidence, and then... You know, everybody's trying to convince me that I'm crazy and you know, whatever. And it's like, and then judge, you know what I call uh, a judge that tells a police officer to what, what to put in the affidavit? I don't call that a neutral detached magistrate. That's what I say about that. That judge must just made himself a witness. And I was like, we have a separation of powers problem. And, 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 and everybody's just kind of looking at me and it's kind of a big deal to him. But it's like, you bet it is. And it was. And it, it was. And it was. And you know who else it was a big deal? To them, okay? To them. It's like, I don't care about the driving. I don't care about the HGN. I don't care about all the stupid things my client said. What I do care about is what you, the felony that you just committed, okay? The felony that you just committed. And so recess, and then we have a big old hearing on that. And Judge John was so nice. Denied. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so, but then it's just, you know, you're setting the, you're setting the tone. Um, that you need to set in a trial uh, to win. You're setting a tone to get a not guilty verdict because this is some bullshit that's going on here. It's like we've got the judge helping the police and we've got an officer that skipped the other field sobriety test because he didn't do the walk and turn to the weather like stand because of environmental conditions and it's like that's a bunch of crap. So he just wanted to shortcut it, get her down to the police station. So then they draw her blood and then uh, during the blood test in that case, I'm sitting there looking at it and uh, I go through my discovery. You got it. The court standard blood discovery motions in this case are not bad. They will get you the stuff that you need. Uh, they'll get you the lab file. They'll get you the chromatograms that your expert can look at or you can look at um, and look to see if those peaks are long and skinny. And, and uh, I mean, it's not. I mean, yes, it's complicated, but if you got to, you can do it if you have to. Period. And so um, then I'm looking at these uh, these test tubes and I'm like, well, those weren't in a box. Okay, where'd you get those test tubes? And then so the phlebotomist gets up there and any person that comes into contact with your client in those cases, I don't care what their role was. You know what your role was? Your role was to figure out whether or not my client was intoxicated. Did you hear any slurred speech? Did you smell the odor of alcohol? Oh, no, no, no. Because this young lady, she extraps, extraps up to a .20. Okay, and then she's a .17 at the station, and then the phlebotomist doesn't see any signs or symptoms of intoxication. What's going on here? Okay, now the test tubes. Okay, usually there's a kit that they put these test tubes in, and it's a little box, and it's got some styrofoam in it. And you have two test tubes in it. It's a blood kit. Okay, it comes from BD. Okay, the company that makes the test tubes. It's for forensic blood. I don't see the blood kit. You know what I see? An HEB bag. <laughs> an HEB bag. And I was just like, that's a, 
I like I looked at my pictures of the test tubes and I was just like, oh, it's a plastic bag, it's no big deal. Well shit, this is my case. This is a huge deal. I was like, are there grapes in there before? <laughs> I was like, where did this H E B bag come from? And it's like, well, just from over there. Well, who went to H-E-B to buy it? <laughs> and when those bags, are they sanitized? Well, this is a sanitary plate. You know that in order to have a valid blood draw, it's got to be done what? In a sanitary place. Did H-E-B sanitize the bags? I was like, hold on a second. What, what's going on here? And then we got the test tubes. And it's like, those are, where did those come from? Those are not in the box. Well, only HPD gets to use the ones in the box. Those come out of a container. What container? What are you talking about? Uh, well, I mean, it's this container. Was that sanitized? Did you clean it? Boy, okay, so if you're a Houston police officer, we get to use the right stuff, but if you're from some other agency, we're going to reach into the container, and then we're going to grab the HEB bag, and we're going to throw in the HEB bag. I was like, what, what's going on? And then, then, ma'am, did you see the phlebotomist? Phlebotomist, did you see what that officer did with those test tubes? Well, no. He put them in his back pocket. In the HEV bag. What? Do you endorse this kind of work? <laughs> you know, I, you know, it's like, I know, you can't apologize for him. Did you? Oh, ma'am, thank you for being here. And then, <laughs> then they call the analysts, okay? And uh, all of us know that in light of the New Mexico versus the Bullcoming case, they have to call, you have a right to confront the analyst that had done the work on your blood test tube. Understand that there's two blood test tubes, okay? According to, and you gotta get the SOP, standard operating procedures, the Houston Police Department standard operating procedure for testing blood. And it talks about how they'll do one test, which uh, is a screening test to determine whether or not there's the presence of alcohol, and then they'll do the second test to get you a, qu a, a qual quantitative number, okay? That's in their SOP. Okay? Um, I always make a confrontation objection that it's, it's their standard operating procedure. They've got to prove to you both of those things, and if they don't, it shouldn't come in. I haven't had that objection sustained yet, but I will continue making it. And um, so then uh, um, the analyst gets up there, and this lady, she was very smart. She had a lot of degrees and all that, and uh, um, she was scared of me because somebody had already told her I was crazy. And, uh, and so she's up there. And uh, I started going through her qualifications, and I was just like, do you, my, my client, you, you know, do you think she's intoxicated? And I swear to God, this analyst is like, well, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not the person to testify to that. Because they're about to bring in the MD, Dr. Walter. Schott. Boy, is he smart. It didn't work out for him either. But um, they're about to bring in Dr. Walter Scheid from the lab. And Dr. Walter Scheid, he's going to get up there, and he's smarter than everybody. And he's going to get up there and go, you know, that if you have this absorption, elimination, da, 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 and, you know, all that. And so Dr. Walter Scheid is going to say it today. This lady gets up there. I was like, you can't even say my client's intoxicated. I was like, well, I can just report the result. Are you going to go to the doctor and have him treat you based on a report without examining you? I was like, let me just cut to the chase, ma'am. How's the video in this case? Um, I haven't watched it. What? I was like, have you seen, look, can I see the clerk's file? Let me see the clerk's file. You're an expert witness on how alcohol affects people. They put it right here. They, they did. The prosecutor put it right here on this piece of paper. You're an expert witness, and you haven't watched the video in this case, and is it all right to put test tubes in HEB? Do you know about the HEB bags? <laughs> and the jury's laughing. They're laughing. Guess I'm, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. It's like they're laughing. And she's like, well, you know, I just, I know it's not your fault. You can't tend to say anything about intoxication. You don't know if my client was above 0.08 at the time of driving. All you can do is you can say you loaded the rack, you put the test tubes in there. And I was like, in that Henry's Law thing that you're talking about, how they, you don't scare me because I learned that in high school chemistry. You know, constant temperature, constant pressure at equilibrium, the air above the substance is going to have the same volume, concentration as the liquid. I know all that, okay? But I want to talk about whether or not she's intoxicated. That's what we're here for. So you can't tell me. You know what? I got nothing else for you. Bye. Thank you. Okay? Boom. Not very impressive. Okay? Blood test case. This is a blood test case. I know we're all scared of them in there. They're challenging, but they also could be kind of funny because these people just, this is the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Dr. Walter Scheid comes in in this case. Dr. Walter Scheid, uh, he's an MD. I think he's like a rise guy. He's a smart guy. Very smart. And um, Dr. Walter Scheid is talking about, uh, uh, I didn't know where Walter Scheid would put us on the retrograde extrapolation, and I wanted to know. 
So pursuant to modern versus state, whenever you deal with the admissibility of scientific evidence, Rule 705B. Okay, Rule 702, Rule 705B, the third prong of Kelly, Kelly versus state. The underlying scientific theory has got to be valid when you're dealing with scientific evidence. The technique has got to be valid. On the occasion in question, it has to be properly applied. A court, pursuant to Kelly, can take judicial notice of the first two prongs of Kelly, the underlying scientific theory and the technique applying the theory. The third prong of Kelly, on whether or not the technique is properly applied, a court can never take judicial notice of. Pursuant to Rule 705B, the Texas Rules of Evidence, when you're going to challenge scientific evidence and you make the objection, the court shall, mandatory language, conduct a hearing outside the presence of the jury uh, and um, make a determination as to whether or not the proponent of the evidence, the state of Texas, can establish these factors to you by clear and convincing evidence. Blah, blah, blah. Boy, it's a lot of stuff. But you know what it does? It gets you a hearing outside the presence of the jury with their witness. Any time you can take the state's witnesses and put them on the witness stand without the jury in the courtroom, and you can figure out what they're going to say, I'm a huge advocate of doing it, whether it's in the form of a motion to suppress, voluntariness of the consent, voluntariness of statements, because I get to know you in, ten, in, 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 in two minutes. I get to know what you're going to say and how you're going to say it, how I'm going to deal with you, because I think on my feet. You know, that's how I am. That's what all of us as trial lawyers have to do. So Dr. Walter Scheid gets up there and says his thing, and he's trying to throw numbers out there that I don't understand. I don't care. And this is, I think, where the text messages came out in that trial, because everybody was about to shoot me because I'm dealing with K factors, and you know, I've got these numbers everywhere, and I'm going through different scenarios. What if we weighed this much, but we weighed this much, and what if our last drink was this time, and we eat this fr fried food that slows absorption versus, you know, we had food that wasn't fried, or we ate earlier, and like, nobody knew what I was doing. I knew what I was doing, but nobody else did. That's the way we wanted. But, so I had a good idea of what Dr. Walter Scheid, where he's going to go. I go through Dr. Walter Scheid, never watched the video, can't say she's intoxicated, can't say tolerance. Boy, if I hear anything more about tolerance in any of these alcohol cases, it's like I want to shoot myself. They don't know shit about tolerance, okay? They can't apply it to your client. They don't know how it applies to them. Really, in the face of 702-705 objection, it shouldn't come in. But if it does, it's like they still have to fess in front of the jury. I've never met your client before. I don't know what she's about, and I certainly can't say that she has tolerance, okay? And I have to say, um, in this case, um, <clears throat> I think it was about at that point that the whole vote thing came out and the bailiff was talking to the prosecutor about what the jury was doing and I accused everybody of prosecutorial misconduct, which I still stand by, and uh, uh, because the bailiff was telling them what's going on in the jury room and despicable. Uh, if, we, if any of us had done it, we'd be looking at a grand jury investigation. At the worst, we'd be looking at, at the very least, we'd be looking at a grievance filed against us. And so uh, in no way, size, shape, or form, like